Good morning to those of you joining us on the internet. Welcome to Open Door Bible Church, West Austin, New Hampshire. This morning we'll be in Acts chapter, Acts chapter 12 and the first part of Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 12, the first verse. Now about that time Herod the king stretched out his hands to harass some from the church. Now, Herod is mentioned a lot. There's more than one Herod. This is Herod Agrippa I. He is the grandson of Herod the Great, who was the king ruling during Jesus' birth. He said he stretched out his hands to harass some from the church. Now, Herod didn't have anything against Christians personally. This was a political move. Everything this guy did was political. He saw that it pleased the citizens. He knew the citizens didn't like Christians. And he was just playing to the crowd. Uh, even today, we still see political figures playing to the crowd. And they will be against anybody that makes them look good. Verse 2. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Now, this is a new development. Things have been a little shaky, but everybody believed up to this time that the apostles had this special protection, that nothing could happen to an apostle. So James is not the first martyr, but he's the first apostle to die. So that's significant. Uh, up until Acts 12, the church had been on a run of success. Things were going well. They were seeing conversion after conversion. Saul of Tarsus had been converted. Cornelius, the Gentile centurion, had been converted. But in Acts 12, the ugly opposition inspired by the devil raised its head. James was certainly not the first Christian to die in faithfulness to Jesus. Back in chapter 7, we read about the death of Stephen, who was martyred. But the death of James was different. It shattered that illusion that the twelve could not be touched. By the way, it says he was killed with the sword. What that's telling you is that he was beheaded. Now, you'll notice there is no attempt to replace James like there was to replace Judas. The best explanation I've got is because James died as a faithful martyr. There was no need to replace him. Uh, now, Herod's going to get bolder. Verses 3 and 4. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, what pleased the Jews? The fact that he killed James. He proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. So it says, because he saw it pleased the Jews, he saw that his popularity had increased. Now what every politician cares about is, what's my popularity rate? This guy was no different. I mean, on the news, once a week, we hear what the president's popularity rating is. Herod was concerned about his popularity rating. And he saw this as a way to improve it. So he's going to seize Peter. Now, this guy is politically shrewd. He understands the landscape. It's Passover. There are thousands and thousands of visitors to Jerusalem. They're all believers. This will be a bad time to arrest Peter publicly. There'd be a turmoil. There'd be a commotion in the crowd. So he's going to wait to execute him late. He's going to arrest him now, put him in jail, and his plan is to execute him right after Passover. Think after everybody's gone home. That's what he's really doing. Said he delivered him to four squads of soldiers. Now, Herod's not a dummy. He knows back in chapter 5, Peter and a bunch of apostles mysteriously escaped from prison. So he's going to assign a high security detail to guard Peter. So there's going to be four soldiers guarding Peter at all times. He's going to be handcuffed to a guy on the right. He's going to be handcuffed to a guy on the left. And there are going to be two soldiers standing outside the cell. Supposed to make it escape proof. But God. Nothing is escape proof if God wants you to escape. So he's got these extra soldiers positioned there. 
God's got a plan. Verse 5. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Now, Herod couldn't do anything to keep the church from praying. Folks, I want you to understand, when the church prays, God listens. God hears. God knows when we're talking to him. God knows when there's a problem. All right, Peter may be locked up, but the church was free to pray. Now, he uses a very specific word. It says constant prayer was made for him. The Greek word constant comes from is a verb. It's actually a medical term, and it talks about stretching a muscle to its limit. So these guys were praying earnestly. They were praying fervently. I'm not sure how much faith they were praying with, but they were praying earnestly and they were praying fervently. Let's see what God does because of that. <clears throat> Verses 6 through 11. And when Herod was about to bring him out, so that tells me Passover was over, that night Peter was sleeping. There's my hero Peter. He's sound asleep. This isn't bothering him any. Bound with two chains between two soldiers. Now I don't know how we get comfortable. But he's sleeping. I mean, he's knocked out. He's sound asleep. And the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side. That's how sound asleep he was. He struck him on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. Herod thought he had him locked up. God sends an angel. The chains fall off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. So now he's going to follow the angel right out of the prison. So we went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real. But he thought he was seeing a vision. He thought he was having a dream. When they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. So here's this locked iron gate, swinging open all by itself. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So let's go back and unpack the verses. Verse 6. That night Peter was sleeping. Peter's not anxious. Peter's not troubled. Peter's not pacing back and forth in the cell. He's sound asleep. By the way, Psalms 127, verse 2, says, He gives his beloved sleep. Anybody ought to be able to sleep as Christians. Just got to remember how much God loves us. Okay, he describes him, bound with chains between two soldiers, guards before the door. The chains, the guards, the doors, the gates, meant nothing to God. God had a plan. God sent his angels. And nothing Herod put in place was going to stand in God's way. Now, verse 8 is interesting. Uh, we got to look at the words. Gird thyself. It seems that Peter had put off the principal part of his clothes that he might sleep with more comfort. He's just settled down and he's going to have a good old night's sleep for himself. His reassuring all that he had thrown off was proof that he had been ready for a leisurely <coughs> night's sleep. There was no evidence of hurry, or any design to elude justice, or even to avoid meeting his accusers in any legal way. It appears that the two soldiers were overwhelmed by a deep sleep, which fell upon them from God. So the angel shows up. These guys fall asleep. By the way, what was the penalty of falling asleep on God duty? Death. These guys fell sound asleep. Chains fell off. Never disturbed them. Never woke them up. Verse 9, Peter doesn't know what's going on. Peter actually thinks it's a vision, a dream. 
did not know what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was being a vision. Now Peter's obeying, Peter's going through the motions, but he hasn't got a clear idea of where he is or what's going on. And it says, and has delivered me from the hand of heaven. Now, this gives us one of those conundrums that we have to wrestle with in Scripture. We're not always going to understand why God does what he does. Uh, if you can understand that, please come and explain it to me. Because I haven't got to figure it out yet. So as I look at Acts and study, James is executed, Peter's released. Now, if you say to me, how come? I don't have the answer. It's just God's got a plan. James had finished what James was supposed to do, and God let him come home. Peter's not done yet. Peter's got a lot more stuff to go through. So he releases Peter. James, he didn't release. God knows what he's doing. I don't. God doesn't have to explain it to me. I just have to say, praise the Lord, I believe in God. All right. Peter's going to present himself to the believers that are praying for him. Verses 12 through 17. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, You are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, It is his angel. Peter, he's still knocking. Peter continues knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. That's Greek for blown away. What are you doing here, Peter? But monitoring to them with his hands to keep silent, he said, will you guys calm down the soldiers a look if they're really going to hear you if you keep making a commotion? He declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go tell these things to James and the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. So again, let's try to unpack some of these verses. Verse 12. He came to the house of Mary, knocked at the door of the gate. Now Peter knew they would be praying for him. Peter knew where they would be praying for him. This was the house they went to to pray. All right? Knocks at the door. The out comes to the door. Hears his voice. And she's so excited she doesn't think to open the gate. She just runs back inside and tells him Peter's there. They're telling him, you're crazy. You're beside yourself. Don't you understand? Peter's in prison and we're praying for him. No. Peter's out of prison. He's standing at the door. Now, so she keeps insisting it's Peter, so they gave her this explanation. It is his angel. Now, in those days, the Jews believed in the idea of guardian angels, just like we do, but they took it one step further. They believed that your guardian angel looked just like you. That's why they said it's Peter's angel. She recognized him. But they say, it's not Peter you're recognizing. It's Peter's angel. Eventually, they go and they let him in because he keeps knocking. And they're amazed. Now, I told you these people pray earnestly. Not sure how much faith they had. Because they couldn't believe Peter was there. They couldn't believe their prayer was answered. Tells us when we pray, we're supposed to pray in faith, believing God's going to answer. Now, these people had the praying part, yet I don't think they yet got to the part where they believed God was really going to answer. Uh, verse 17 says, <laughs> Go and tell these things to James and the brethren. Now, they're not talking about the James who was just martyred in the last chapter. They're talking about James who is the half-brother of Jesus. Jesus had half-brothers and half-sisters. All right? Uh, they had the same mother. They had different fathers. Everybody else had Joseph as a father. Jesus had God as his father. So that's why I describe him as half-brothers. 
But it says that he departed and went to another place. Now, he knew thereafter, he's not a dummy. These guys are going to come looking for me. Peter decides he ought to go someplace else. Probably a pretty good decision. Uh, this is basically the last time in Acts where we see Peter spoken about. Uh, we see Peter again mentioned in Galatians chapter 2. And then he writes First and Second Peter as epistles. But we don't see him again in the book of Acts. One of the reasons is the emphasis as we go through chapter 12 and beyond. Emphasis is changing from Jews in Jerusalem to Gentiles in the rest of the world. Alright, so different emphasis. Alright, back to the jail. What happens to the soldiers? Verses 18 and 19. Then as soon as it was day, there was no small stir, that's an understatement, among the soldiers about what happened to Peter. But when Herod had searched for him and not found him, and you looked under every rock you could find, no Peter. So he examines the gods and commanded they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. Now that he is Herod. So in those days, if you were a god, you had a prisoner, the prisoner escaped, you were going to get whatever penalty the prisoner you were guarding was going to get. In this case, the prisoner was going to die, so all the gods died. You know? So be it. We're going to see Herod again. Verses 20 and 21. Now Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. But they came to him with one accord, and having made Blastus, the king's personal aid, their friend, they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. So on a set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne, and gave an oration to them. He's going to give a speech. Now, these people desperately need to have a good relationship with the king. That's where their food supply comes from. So what they did is they made friends with the king's personal aid, this guy Blastus. Uh, don't know if they bribed him, don't know if they took him out to lunch every day, don't know if they cut his grass, but they did something to make friends with him. And they used that to get them an audience with the king. So the king agrees he's going to come and make a speech to him. Uh, says he was going to be arrayed in royal apparel and give a speech. Now, my notes say he had dressed in impressive clothes. Harris spoke before an audience eager to please him. Uh, some of the commentators I read will describe this in greater detail. Uh, it's not in the Bible, but I give you the historical view. This was an outdoor gathering in a big amphitheater. He had on clothes that were woven with silver threads. Guy stands up on the stage, the sun is shining on him, and he literally glowed because of this metallic threads in his clothes. And so it's a very awe-inspiring sight. Uh, verses 22 and 23. And the people kept shouting, the voice of a god and not a man. Boy, are they sucking him. Boy, do they want this guy to like him. The voice of a god and not of a man. Then immediately, the angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God. And he was eaten by worms and died. And thus we never hear about Herod again. Uh, now, it's human nature to look for political deliverers. There aren't any. Uh, people of Tyre and Sidon wanted to praise Herod as if he was a god. They would have said anything to get this guy happy with him. They would have said anything to get the food supply turned back on. They were just doing everything they could to suck up. Now, what Herod should have done is said, no, I'm not a god. This, this, is, this is me speaking. This is not God speaking. But he didn't. He took the credit. He accepted the praise. He kind of puffed his chest up and said, yeah, that's me. I'm a god. 
Well, God didn't like that. He was eaten by worms and died. Now, the manner of Herod's death was appropriate to his spiritual state. He was corrupted from the inside out. In writing to the Roman world, the ancient Jewish historian Josephus, the guy you'll hear about a lot, described the death of Herod in very gory details. This was an ugly scene. All right. As a result of that, verses 24 and 25, but the word of God grew and multiplied. So God's blessing. Now, there's trouble, there's persecution, but the church is still growing. By the way, the church grows the most during the time of persecution. Places in this world, third world countries, communist countries, places where the church has to meet in secret, places where the church has to meet underground, the church is growing much faster than it is in the United States. We look like we're in really terrible shape if you compare us to some of the third world countries of folks who are under persecution. Verse 25, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. They also took with them John, whose surname was mine. So, we get God's word growing, multiplying. Herod hadn't stopped anything. Herod hadn't kept the church from growing. Herod had fought against God. He killed James. He imprisoned Peter. But God's going to see that the church just keeps on rolling. Verse 25. Barnabas and Saul returned to Jerusalem. Now, if you went back to chapter 11, they had taken up a collection for the saints in Jerusalem because there was a famine there. Paul and Barnabas hand delivered that money. They're coming back from delivering that money. They brought with them John Mark. John Mark is Barnabas' cousin. We will see John Mark later on in Paul's missionary journeys. Uh, this is also the guy who comes to write the Gospel of Mark. So this is our first introduction to him, uh, but we will see him more often. That moves me into chapter 13. Uh, I have this verses from the word, song, Holy Spirit up here behind me because we're about to talk about the Holy Spirit. We're going to see Barnabas and Saul are called and sent out by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is alive. He is well. We welcome him here every Sunday, and the best Sundays I have is when the Holy Spirit takes over, tells me to toss out my message, and the Holy Spirit just drums and stomps. I love it when that happens. All right, verse 1. Now in the church that was in Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, my man who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. So there's a bunch of people active in this church at Antioch. Uh, so Barnabas is there, Saul, John Mark, these other people we're naming, Simeon, Lucas, Manan. Now I'm trying to do a tactful pronunciation. Uh, if you look in your Bible, it says Simeon was called Niger. That's the pronunciation I got when I listened to this read by somebody. You would pronounce the word differently today. And what the word basically means is black. So this was a person with black skin, probably from Africa, who was part of this multi-ethnic, multicultural church at Antioch. Uh, many people believe that it was the same Simeon who carried Jesus' cross. We heard about that back in Luke chapter 23. Then we get this guy who was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, Manan. This was one. This was the same Herod who beheaded John the Baptist. So these guys grew up together, went very different ways. One kills John the Baptist and presides over a trial of Jesus. The other becomes a Christian and a leader in a dynamic congregation at Antioch. You can't tell how people are going to turn out. You never know who's going to end up doing what. 
So these two guys grew up together who ended up very differently. Now, verse 2, the Holy Spirit. Now, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So it says they were ministering. They were serving. They were probably teaching. They were probably leading worship. They were probably singing songs of praises. Sounds like all the stuff we do in church. When you come here, you become a minister. We join together to minister to God. We minister to him in song. We minister to him in praise. We minister to him as we pray. And then we minister as we study God's word so that we can in turn go out and teach others. That's why we learn stuff. We don't learn stuff to get Bible fat. We don't learn stuff so we can tell folks how bright we are. We learn stuff so we can be better servants. Uh, as part of that, they fasted. They gave up food for a period of time. Why? Because that increases our sensitivity to God and what he's trying to tell us. Now, obviously that worked because as they fasted, they were sensitive to the message of the Holy Spirit. This was a word of calling that would guide Barnabas and Saul into a very specific work. Holy Spirit says specifically, separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work I have called them to. Now, they're being called into missionary service. By the way, this is the first time we see somebody called to be a missionary. This is the first time we see somebody sent out. But I want you to think about the church body. I want you to think about the folks who told you were in the church. What we've just sent out was probably the two most qualified people in the church. That's okay. God will make up the difference. God will raise up people to replace them. Uh, we get thinking sometimes that in the body of Christ we're so important that we're irreplaceable. Nobody's irreplaceable. God can replace every single one of us anytime he wants. Uh, God doesn't owe me anything. I owe God everything. All right. So they do more fasting and praying. Verse 3. And having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and sent them away. Uh, let me just read for you Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we're all servants. God's got a job for us. The only single thing we ever need to do is when God speaks to us, the answer is, yes, sir. Right away, sir. We just do whatever God tells us to do. So they've been fasting and praying. Holy Spirit shows up. It says now the church and the church leaders laid hands on them. They brought them forward. They all gathered around them and laid their hands on them. They touched their shoulders. They touched their heads. There was physical contact. Now, I'm sure these guys have been what you would consider ordained in the past. But this was setting them aside for a very different specific work. Uh, notice very specifically the church is sending them out. They're going to be supported. They're going to be sent by a specific church. When they come back, they're going to come back to this church and tell them what happened. Much like the missionaries we send out, send us letters to tell us what's going on. Now, all those guys we've got that are working for us in third world countries, they don't have the funds to come back and report in person. But they send us letters. I read the letters to you on a regular basis. They keep in touch with us because they understand Part of their financial support comes from our church, and they want to let us know what's going on. All right, they're ready to set out. We're going to see their first stops. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, the Christians of the church at Antioch sent 
Paul and Barnabas out, but more importantly, the Holy Spirit sent them out. Now, any group of Christians can send someone, but if the Spirit isn't involved, if the Spirit hasn't said to send them, nothing is going to be accomplished that matters. We've got to always follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Now, since they went down to Seleucia, there aren't any specific works recorded that took place in Seleucia. Seleucia was a city near Antioch. I've got to think that there were believers in Seleucia. Now, maybe they went there just because that was the closest place they could get on a ship. But it's hard to imagine they didn't witness to somebody. Uh, they didn't give out a gospel tract. They didn't hand out a coin. They didn't uh, do street preaching. I'm sure they did something. It just isn't recorded. All right, so they're going to sail, and they're going to arrive on the island of Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. That's John Mark. That's Barnabas' cousin. He's the assistant. Terry, he's the roadie. He's the guy carrying the bags. He's the guy putting up the tent. He's the guy getting everything ready for him. This is how he breaks into ministry. By the way, if you're going to be in ministry, if you're going to accomplish something for God, you've got to start at the bottom, and you've got to do the dirty work first. You've got to be a roadie before you can be a performer. You've got to be a roadie before you can be a speaker. You've got to do the grunt work first. You've got to get initiated. You've got to learn the ropes. So, that's what John Mark is doing. He's the roadie. Uh, when they arrived in Selmus, we're not told exactly why they went to Cyprus first. What we do know is from back in Acts chapter 4, Barnabas grew up on that island. So maybe they went there because Barnabas thought he knew some people and had some, some insight. Since they preached the word of God in the synagogues. Now this is early in the church history. At this time, the Jewish synagogues were still open to letting anybody who wanted to speak come in and speak. So that gave Barnabas and Saul an opening. They could come in and say, we've got a word to share with the synagogue. And they were given the opportunity to speak. And they were committed, they would speak Jesus. And people's mouths would fall open because that's not what they were expecting. They were expecting them to explain something from the Old Testament. But they didn't. They used that opportunity to preach Jesus. <coughs> Talks again about John Mark. Uh, travels with Paul and Barnabas on the trip. And I told you this is the same Mark who later writes the Gospel of Mark that bears his name. Mark was a very valuable companion for Barnabas and Saul. He grew up in Jerusalem and was an eyewitness of many of the events in the life of Jesus, and could relate them with a special power to Barnabas and Saul, and to others to whom they preached. I won't tell you this as doctrine, but many folks believe, remember back in the garden when they came to arrest Jesus, and there was a guy that said he ran off and dropped his cloth? That was probably John Mark. Can't tell you that dogmatically, but that's what all of them Books I read, believe. All right. Now they're going to meet somebody. Verses 6 and 7. Now when they had gone to the island of Patmos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. He was not named after Jesus. Just Jesus was a common name in those days. Bar probably means son of. This man called the Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. So somehow he heard about these two guys, heard that they were teaching the word of God. Now, probably somebody from the synagogue they preached in came and told the proconsul about it. But he asked them to come and hear him. They're in a city called Papos. It is on the west coast of Cyprus. And the thing it was known for most was its immorality. Here, Barnabas and Saul faced a combination of immorality and spiritual darkness. Gee, sounds a lot like the United States of America today. 
That's us, folks. They're moral and spiritually done. This guy was described as a Jewish magician and a false prophet. Right. Now we get another player. We got a proconsul. Proconsul is a legal term. The guy's name was Sergius Paulus. This was an important man. A Roman proconsul was responsible for an entire province, so I think he's like a governor, and answered to the Roman Senate. How forgiving do you think the Roman Senate was of mistakes? Not very. You went to the Roman Senate and got a bad report, you probably left without your head being intact. Off with his head. Off with his head. All right, so, important guy, politically connected, wants to keep his head intact. All right, this guy is going to resist Paul and Barnabas. But Elimas, the sorcerer, as so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. By the way, this is what happens when you get filled with the Holy Spirit. You get bold. You grow a spiritual backbone. So, He's filled with the Spirit. And he says, looking at him intently, he says, Oh, full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Verse 12. This is, this is the shouting verse. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Now, before I explain these verses, does anything jump into your head? Do you see any irony in these verses? I want you to think of Paul's experience as he gets saved. Paul was struck blind. Paul says, what will I do with this guy? Ah, I know. I'll do with him what was done with me. And this guy is struck blind, not able to see, looking for somebody to lead him around by the hand. Gee, just like happened to Saul when he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus. I mean, we do those things that we know to do. Nobody ever instructed Paul on calling a curse of blindness on somebody. But it happened to Paul. It's fresh in his mind. He's never forgotten it. Aha! I know just what to do in this situation. Just, you know, thought I'd throw that in. So, verse 8. Elimus the sorcerer for so his name is translated. Paul was opposed by this man. His real name was by Jesus. Uh, the commentary I read speculated that Luke couldn't bear to call this guy Jesus, so he used his translated name. Uh, he didn't even want to, want to soil the name of Jesus by using it with this guy. Now, what's the message for us? We should never be surprised we should never be shaken when we hit opposition. Whenever there's going to be a great success, whenever the doors open, there's going to be opposition. Don't be surprised by it. Remember that I told you, because God put it in His Word. Whenever there's an open door, whenever there's a chance for great opportunity, somebody's going to fight against it. If it happens in the church, somebody's going to say, well, we never did that before. That's not how we do it here. Folks, the Holy Spirit likes nothing better than to do new things, to do different things. Remember we talked about new wine and new wineskins? God likes new. We hate change. We're people. We want to do it the same way every time. I mean, I, I, I will tell you, the churches I've been in, we're good people 
who've gone to church for 20 years absolutely lose their cool, break down and have a fit when somebody dares to sit in their seat. By the way, I checked here, there are no names on any of these chairs. Sit any place you want. If you're going to sit someplace different, tell me because you'll goof me up for the whole service trying to figure out why you sat somewhere different. But God likes change. God likes to stir things up. We love the status quo. We fight and we fight and we fight to protect the status quo. God loves change. God loves to shake things up. God loves to get us to do things that are different. Different is good for us. All right. Someone escaped. Uh, so, the guy is struck blind. Again, Paul had a similar experience. Paul knew just what to do. And as a result of all that, the pro council believed. Now, you might think Paul was harsh in his confrontation, but he was concerned about the eternal salvation, the eternal destiny of this pro council. He could see that this guy was trying to get in the way of him being saved. Didn't take that well. Uh, and once this guy got to listen to Paul's teaching, it says he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. That was the miracle, folks. He heard the gospel, he listened, and he got converted. You know what? If we just share the gospel, plain and simple, folks will get saved. Now, sometime it's the first time you tell them, sometime it's the 20th time you tell them, sometime you're the fifth person to tell them. It's okay. It's not about taking credit. Now, in the Old West, whenever the cowboy shot somebody, he got to cut a notch in his gun. Folks, we don't cut notches here. We don't count. We don't keep track. Never do I want to have a testimony service here where somebody stands up and says, I want you to know I brought 113 people to the Lord. No, you didn't. Trust me. We don't keep count. We don't keep score. We do our job. Remember the Bible says, Sometimes I plant, sometimes I water, sometimes I pull weeds, and sometimes I get to be there when the flower comes up. But we all work together. It's not about who gets credit for this conversion. It's about us working together as a family to get people into the kingdom of God. Who gets to kneel down with somebody and pray with them isn't important. It isn't. You can kneel down and pray with them just as good as I can, and they pray with you, they're going to be just as saved as if they pray with me or with Pastor Terry. By the way, that's why when we have prayer time, I have different people praying. I don't want you to think I'm the official designated prayer of the church. God's just as concerned with your prayers as he is with mine. I can remember a Russian missionary in church one day having a migraine headache, grabbed my wife and said, pray for me. And she looked at him and said, don't you want my husband to pray for you? And he said, no, your prayers are just as good as your husband's. And my wife prayed for the missionary and his headache went away. God can answer anybody's prayers. There's nobody special. There's nobody here with a check mark next to him, has the gift of prayer. We can all do that. God wants us to all do that. And that's where we're going to start today. So for those of you watching in, Thank you for joining us at Open Door Bible Church, West Ossipi, New Hampshire, right in the same parking lot with McDonald's. Come and visit us on Sunday. We'd love to see you sitting right here in a chair with us. God bless you.